But we've got a great panel we're going to talk about. Uh, I'm sorry I failed in moving these things along the right way. Here we are. Return to Venus, a new generation of interplanet science. Have you ever made you? Here you are. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us, and thank you for you know coming this early to uh, have a great discussion. We invite you to to really think out of the box and. Uh, you know, engage in the conversation that we are going to have in reference uh, to Venus this morning. It truly is an exciting time for Venus, and uh, we're delighted to be here this morning to share some of the present, well, even the past, present, and, and future of Venus exploration. And with that, I'll, I'll pass to um, briefly uh, then uh, introduce or our distinguished panel this morning. It um, yeah, maybe if we could have the next slide, please. And the control remote just doesn't seem to be working. So I should say that I'm Adriana from the International Program Scientist International Liaison for Venus Exploration that the, that, uh, the agency has, and it is uh, for me a great pleasure to, to join you this morning with this very distinguished pa panel. We have Professor Darby Dyer, uh, who is the deputy. I'll be very brief. I invite you to read their, their bios as, uh, as the, the introduction mentioned. Um, she has done extraordinary work in, the, in exploration in, in the area of. Uh, you know, in the geological science, and she is the deputy principal investigator for Betty and also a collaborator on the ESA NASA Edition Mission uh, for Venus Exploration. Um, then we have Dr. Jim Garvin, who is uh, the past NASA chief scientist, and uh, and uh, he today is Jeffrey and is the principal investigator for the Da Vinci. The Mission. And then we have uh, Mr. Josh Wood from Lackey Martin. Lackey Martin has been an extraordinary partner for NASA and all uh, planetary missions, and we're very lucky to have them be part and be constructing our spacecraft of this uh, as uh, for Da Vinci and uh, very fast. And in the next slide, we want to try to very briefly just mention why. We uh, go. <laughs> just mention a little bit about you know the the fantastic missions that we are really building a new era of Venus exploration on this shoulder of these giant missions that we were so fortunate to have. And not only uh, Mariner 10 with the flyby, then we had the Galileo flyby, then we went to the Pioneer Orbiter with the four. Uh, Probes, uh, the ESA, the European Space Agency, Venus Express Orbiter, and the currently orbiting orbiter of uh, Akasuki, who is also providing extraordinary data from Venus, as well as, uh, of course, the Magellan data that uh, you know map in such detail for the first time with radar uh, the, the surface of Venus and the Veneras. Um, Vegas that not only had landers but also had a balloon. And uh, even I wanted to briefly mention the Arecibo as well as the ground observation, which provided just extraordinary information. So we, that has been a tremendous complement of this new data set. So from here, as we move forward with the next slide, we wanted to very briefly share why why we is such an extraordinary time for Venus exploration. Not only Venus informs us uh, about the understanding of how is the evolution, you know, governs climate and the geological evolution of, of our, our solid surface planets in our solar system, 
but also Dino's post that you or how they have instability, the stability of that stability uh, may have influenced and evolved in our solar system. Dino's also provides us uh, with the ground truth, uh, you know, as we move forward investigating exoplanetary instability in other areas of our, of our galaxy. So, and, and it would be remiss not to mention that also Venus would provide a great opportunity for future human exploration by doing Venus gravity uh, assist. It would considerably shorten the cruise period to get humans to Mars. So that's a, that's a kind of thing that would provide also a, an opportunity to do more science in Venus as well. So in the next slide, just uh, very briefly, um, I'm going the other way, please. Uh, just concluding my portion introduction for the framework is we wanted to show you the timeline, the beauty of the chronology of where we were, and even uh, the last in yellow are all the heliophysics missions that have done solar, uh, you know, Venus from a gravity assist. Then we have the, the blue, which are the um, proposed missions that we've be done as a follow-up, for example, to Akasuki and Venera D, which is in the mission concept phase, which NASA has been um, participating with via a joint science mission team. And then we we have um, the link that which are um, the private sector missions like Rocket Lab that are also going to Gravity assist and provides opportunity to, to do Venus science. So, with this plateau and, and wealth of missions, uh, now we're going to go to the phase of the very exciting near future missions that NASA is uh, at least is preparing. And uh, we have been to start with the very task on leaving with uh, Professor. Uh, Next slide, please. So I'm delighted to be here today to talk about Veritas. Uh, we've been proposing forms of this vision for more than this, this mission for more than a decade. And it's just a thrill that we are finally selected and it's an almost equal thrill that I actually get to talk about it in person in a conference. So um, I'm the deputy principal and investigator of Veritas, and I'll be speaking on behalf of not just the people on this screen, but all the many hundreds of people who helped make this mission work. So Next slide, please. So let's talk about a timeline. Veritas will be the first one to launch. Um, right now, we're hoping for a December of 27 launch date, or maybe if this is November, it'll be somewhere in that time frame. Uh, we, go, we cruise to Venus, and then we do an aero braking phase in which we do spectroscopy. Then we, we move in for the um, radar and gravity, and then we'll also uh, resume um, some spectroscopy in the, in the science space, too. And I'll keep mentioning the spectroscopy because I'm a spectroscopist, can't help it. Uh, so these are some, some diagrams of what that looks like and a, a, a quick little uh, sketch of what our crews will look like. Next slide, please. So Veritas has very ambitious goals. Um, our, our science traceability matrix has 18 different science questions that we want to answer. But basically, we want to discover the secrets of this lost, habitable world. Um, as Adriana mentioned, um, Venus is coming to the public eye and the scientific eye recently because of a lot of different reasons, not the least of which is that Venus may now have had uh, liquid water present on the surface for as long as 3 billion years. Now compare that to the 300 million years of water on Mars and you can see why our attention with respect to habitability is switching over to looking at Venus now. Um, so we'd like to know a lot of questions about Venus. Um, how do rocky planets evolve? It's a very important question and you can see some of the issues that we're going to Look at with with Veritas. Um, the, the, what is the rock type? We don't know the rock type on the surface of Venus. It's an abysmal state of affairs. Um, we know what the surface of Venus looks like now, sort of from Magellan, but uh, we have a lot of unanswered questions. Prior geologic regimes, uh, did the volcanism that we see on the surface come all at once, or was it catastrophic, or was it um, steady? Um, are there plate tectonics on Venus right now? So those are some of the really important questions that we want to answer. And then, of course, we get to things like, what are the active processes? Is there a volcanism occurring right now on the surface of Venus? And then what about water? Um, do the atmospheric models that suggest the presence of those long-duration oceans 
Um, are they really accurate and how do they influence the geological evolution of the surface of Venus? So we actually have uh, two instruments and three investigations on um, Veritas. The first one is a, a, a radar, a synthetic aperture radar, which I'll talk more about in a minute. Um, and that, of course, will give us uh, amazing topography. Uh, we'll we're inc increase the topography by a couple orders of magnitude over what Magellan can do. Uh, we'll also have some very specific targeted data sets where we look at things in really uh, fine detail. And then the other instrument is a Venus emissivity mapper, which is a spectrometer. Um, it was long thought that you couldn't do spectroscopy on Venus, but in fact, there are some uh, windows in the spectrum of CO2 near one micron, and you can do spectroscopy through those little windows if you're clever. So that's what we're going to do with Veritas. And then finally, we're going to have a, a gravity science investigation, which will um, give us a lot of information about the interior of Venus. Next slide, please. So here's a little bit more about how these um, instruments look like. Um, and, and some stats. Um, uh, so the, uh, the elevation model will be 200, 250 meters horizontal resolution and five meter vertical resolution, which is really exciting for those of us who have dealt with uh, basically feeling around in the fog through the Michelin measurements for all these years. Um, we can also look for uh, deformation. So we'll make, we'll make the first interferometric deformation maps. And we can also look for surface change. It's not inconceivable that if there is current volcanism on the surface of Venus, that we might actually see change over the duration of our mission and certainly um, over the duration of uh, Magellan to our mission to perhaps into the ambitious time. Um, then we'll be able to distinguish between surface rock type. So again, very important. Um, we want to know if the tessera, which are these weird terrains, which I'll show you pictures of in a second, we want to know if the, if the tessera are actually continental remnants or if they're just, uh, what, as one of my colleagues put it, the scum on a basaltic pond. Um, so we'll see. If, we'll see what the rock types are on Venus. And then we want to look for, as I said, um, active volcanoes. So, and finally, Veritas will make some amazing measurements that will finally constrain the interior structure of Venus. Next slide, please. So here are the key scientific questions we want to answer. Continents. Does Venus have continents? Um, and did they form in the presence of water as they do on Earth? Uh, what's the volcanic history? Is it, is it steady or episodic? Um, was there, uh, was there, is there, could there be subduction on, um, on Venus? And uh, did plate tectonics on Earth start in the same way that we now see it restarting perhaps on Venus? Um, and then heat flow. What is the heat flow? How does Venus lose its heat? It's a hot place now because of the dense atmosphere, but the interior is still losing heat. We want to know how that happened. Next slide, please. So, as Adriana said, another key thing here is to understand, um, use Veritas's data to understand habitability. And there are a couple of things that we can do with this for, for this. Um, if the tessera turn out to be granitic, on Earth, granitic rocks form in the presence of water. And so um, if we see uh, granitic tessera in highlands, then that pretty much says those are continents and they probably did form in the presence of past water. Um, we also uh, can inform the question of secondary atmosphere. What's the history of um, outgassing in the atmosphere? And of course, um, Da Vinci will inform that in more and different ways. Uh, we want to look at tectonism, uh, deformation, faulting, uh, surface weathering. So various things that are happening on the surface, understand the energy budget, and then of course look at the magnetic field. So all of these factors are not only important for understanding the geologic evolution, but they also impact habitability. Next slide, please. So I always love to talk about tessera because tessera are sort of a wonderful and unique phenomenon to us planetary scientists. So tessera have the appearance of uh, I always tell my students, it's like if you took a piece of aluminum foil and crumpled it up and then tried to stretch it back out, that's what the tessera look like. They're very rugged uh, terrains. They're usually embayed by the basalts that surround them. Um, they have a, a slightly different radar signature, which might be a function of texture or it might be a compositional difference. And so we're just desperate to know what, what's going on with the tessera. So, uh, for, so for the tessera, for example, we will be able to figure out what the iron content is, which will tell us something about the rock type. And then, of course, we'll also find um, some topography and do some imaging so that if we ever get a, a, another um, full-size lander on the surface of Venus, the tessera would be a great place to go. Uh, next slide, please. So coming soon, December 2027, we're launching Veritas. We cannot wait to, to um, not only revolutionize our understanding of the Venus surface, but 
also provide foundational data sets that will last for generations to come. We're going to produce terabytes of data on the surface of Venus that will be the fodder for um, probably several decades of um, student work, and I'm really excited about that as well. So with that, I'll pass over to Jim. Well, thank you. Well, yeah, well, thanks, Artie. And uh, now I'd like to turn to the other side of Venus, which is Venus is a planet that is gifted with a massive atmosphere, one of the most interesting and unique, basically a chemical fossil record of its history, its climatology. Da Vinci, building on the, the legacy of Leonardo, is all about accessing that atmosphere for the first time in what will have been 50 years in the history of human exploration of Venus. Um, our team, um, is very proud to have this. You can see our two deputy uh, principal investigators, Stephen Getty and John Arney, and our key partner, Lockheed Martin, and you'll hear from Josh in a minute, with instruments coming from across uh, our country, including the Jet Propulsion Lab and the Space Science Systems and Applied Physics Lab um, and partnerships elsewhere. So our job with Da Vinci is to build on the, the great stuff that you heard Darby talking about from the standpoint of Veritas and the legacy before, and really understand what the atmosphere can tell us as that bridge to the future understanding it means. Next slide, please. Um, I don't think this is working. So be ready, because in the summer of 2031, we will enter the Venus atmosphere. We'll be finally home. Our spacecraft system will carry the kinds of instruments I'll describe in a minute that we've been operating on the surface of Mars for 10 years. Imagine bringing the chemistry lab to the samples. And that's our job on Venus. One of our colleagues wants to describe the Da Vinci mission, which will enter the atmosphere and over an hour long period, make an order of magnitude more measurements ever made before for any planetary atmosphere through a probe-based mission and come to rest in those Tesla that Darby were talking about. We are going to the first Tesla ever observed by a woman or man from the Arecibo radio telescope, very perfectly named Alpha. Not beta, not gamma, um, alpha. We'll probably rename it later. But so our mission will bring the chemistry lab to that atmosphere, providing the foundational measurements for models that will allow us to better derive rock types by understanding the last rate of temperature. So let's talk about the mission. Next slide, please. Um, so the central question, and you heard that from Darby and Adrian, of course, and our prime directive, borrowing from Star Trek, is why and how did Venus and Earth diverge as planetary system objects, rocky planets with atmospheres, and histories of climates, oceans perhaps, and how did their habitability state change? And can we use our Venus, the exoplanet next door, as the ground truth in this era of James Webb and future era of Nancy Grace Roman and Luvax and whatever they're going to be called, to use Venus as that guide planet? for what we'll be able to see with the fantastic astrophysical dimension that is about to start. Next slide. So that's the big question. Our job with Da Vinci goes back to work done in the early 80s. So first identified by the SSEC report, this is we gotta go and measure key things about the Venus atmosphere. They're missing and they're stopping us from making progress. So Da Vinci's job is to fill those in. How did that atmosphere form and evolve? Well, what's the water content? What could the state of weather have been over time? Why is it today in this runaway greenhouse atmospheric climate state? How can we understand the role of volcanism integrated over time on Venus? And how does the atmosphere interact with the surface and the role of water? We want to build a story that goes from that basaltic Venus we sort of know today, imperfectly, perhaps we're in kindergarten, to the Venus we want to explore and understand in this new era that we'll be launching um, in, in the next decade. Next slide. So Da Vinci's job is to do that. I'll talk about the instruments in a minute because we're an instrument-rich mission, but for us, the talk starts in June of 2029. NASA budgets will, of course. We would launch our mission um, as a composite Venus observing system with a flyby spacecraft, a carrier, uh, the probe mission, which is a descent sphere in an aeroshell, and then a capacity for our flyby spacecraft to also later go into orbit. We'll launch and we'll encounter Venus six months later producing 30 gigabits of new data about the atmosphere with movies of the motions of perhaps mystery absorbers um, and, a, and a technology demonstration experiment being built at Goddard with partnership with Italy to look at the spectroscopy in the ultraviolet of that upper atmosphere. We'll do that and quality factors better than Hubble did at Venus. And we'll come back around again and do the same on another flyby to set us up for our entry at high noon, sounds like a Western, 
Um, at high noon over Venus, Alpha Regio, an area that's I've been told twice the size of Texas and bigger than France. So we'll come to rest in Alpha during our 59 minute transect of the atmosphere. Next slide. Um, so we're an instrument rich mission. In some sense, Da Vinci builds on the legacy of Cassini with probes and instruments and flybys. Um, and so we will carry with us two primary instruments that can conduct flyby investigations using remote sensing. Visor, which is a multi ultraviolet near infrared camera system that can make some primitive rock type measurements as well as measuring the, with movies the motions of clouds. And our technology demonstration experiment, Cubis which is a 0.2 nanometer resolution ultraviolet imaging spectrometer. We'll carry that to Venus in a compact form to make measurements as a new technology for planetary. And then our descent sphere, the probe, in the probe flight system, which will enter the atmosphere with five experiments, two of which are derivative of the measurements we're making on Mars with the SAM payload suite developed at Goddard with partnership with JPL. We will be measuring the atmosphere at parts per million to billion of the diagnostic chemistry, including the noble gases, which tell us about planetary evolution, the ratios of deuterium to hydrogen and water, state of sulfur isotopes and isotopal logs, all of that from the top of the cloud deck down to the surface over Alpha Regio. We'll also measure temperature pressure accelerations every 15 meters throughout the atmosphere, not once a 10 kilometers, every 15 meters to establish the latch rate, to see the supercritical fluid transition, in the Venus atmosphere, we expect it to occur 10 kilometers high. When the CO2 is no longer that ideal gas we all love from high school chemistry, it becomes supercritical. Now that's cool. And then to measure the atmosphere surface interaction chemically all the way to the surface, um, while we're also imaging with a multi band near IR camera that will allow us to also measure with reflectance spectroscopy aspects of the composition to connect to Darby's measurements from above. And we're also going to carry a student collaboration experiment. Uh, led by the Applied Physics Lab and Johns Hopkins, thank you for our partners in the state, um, led by Noel Eisenberg and Sarah Horst, which will bring over 100 students to measure the partial pressure of oxygen, a key variable for how rocks behave at the surface. Next slide. So we have a lot of action during our mission. And really, the cross-section of the atmosphere will address these kinds of questions. We'll hit the upper atmosphere and our atmosphere entry interface excitingly in June of 2031. And we'll start measuring accelerations on the spacecraft for all future planetary entries of Venus. And then we'll start sampling gases with a multi inlet system at around 67 kilometers. First, with a tunable laser spectrometer built at JPL by Chris Webster and Amy Hoffman. And then with our Venus mass spectrometer developed at Goddard. We'll continue making measurements ingesting gases below the homopause so we can measure the noble gases at the kind of precision we did at Mars and then continuing sampling that atmosphere every 100 meters or so to measure the trace gas chemistry all the way to the surface while imaging from below the atmosphere, from below the glass to the surface to measure aspects of the rocks. Next slide, please. Uh, that's just our spacecraft descent sphere with its densely packed payload. It's a flying rover, basically. Next slide. Um, now, one of the key questions is the role of water. Darby mentioned that, of course, central to many things about how rocks form, climate, habitability. We're going to address that using the Trident to approach that planetary sciences have used by using four different approaches using chemistry. Chemistry, never met chemistry, but lied to me. We're going to use chemistry to look at the origins of that uh, and evolution of the volatile state of Venus through the noble gases and their isotopes. We've never measured krypton and xenon very well, nothing about xenon. We need to measure those gases, as well as helium and others. We need to look at degassing over time to look at just the bulk uh, amount of those noble gases, helium through, through xenon. And we need to look at deuterium to hydrogen in all the water in the Venus atmosphere, which is relatively large from the top of the clouds to the surface. Not one time, as Pioneer Venus did it, but 10 times. Those will provide the direct quantitative analytical measurements to refine the questions we have now about the history of water. Next slide, please. Um, so we're also going to do descent imaging. People will often said, geez, how's that going to work? It's a pretty dense atmosphere. You can't see your foot from your toe. Well, well you can. The Soviet generals did show us that. Um, I wrote my thesis about them. You can see rocks. We love rocks. But we're going to start imaging the surface of Venus from just under the cloud hazes, about 100,000 feet high, making measurements in band ratios 
and in bundles that will let us retrieve information about the same kind of rock type chemistry that Darby will be measuring from orbit at scales from hundreds of meters down to a few meters. So we'll bridge the scale gap from what Veritas will do elegantly globally right over a key patch of, of pristine tessera in alpha in our descent. We expect to acquire between 200 and 500 images, and we will use bundles of them um, to make, using machine vision techniques, topographic maps at scales that will help calibrate and understand what the brilliant topography of Veritas will be. This will uncover the tessera at human scales. And this is a very important aspect because we'll also be measuring the chemistry as we do that. Next slide. So the Vinci has a tall order to do. We also feel very strongly with our team, led by John Arney, Steve Kane, and others, that connecting the Venus we measure absolutely quantitatively to what we'll be able to infer from missions like the James Webb Space Telescope is critical. We will see Venus analogs. It's, it's fairly assured based on the state of stars and planets we can detect with that. So understanding our own Venus as the calibration point for that's important, and that will give us a bridge to habitability of exovenuses that may be in a different climate state. Finally, we can distinguish the false positive issues associated with oxygen and other gases by using what da Vinci measures about a real planet next door and apply those to those other worlds. So we think connections in the solar system and beyond da Vinci will really be powerful, bridging the gap in astrophysics and into climate modeling of worlds like Earth. Next slide. And so we are very excited as a team, hundreds of people working on Da Vinci across all of our partners. You can see some of them that have been working with us for the past years. We've actually been bidding this mission since 2009. So it dates me, my hair is gray in the, in the attempt to do that. Um, and you can see some of the, the great women and men that have made Da Vinci what it is, a mission that will connect science, technology, engineering, and math and the arts together, bringing together a Venus for all of us. So thank you all. We can't wait to get started and fly this mission to Venus. Next, I'm going to turn it over to Josh, um, one of our key members of Lockheed Martin, our prime partner. Over to you, Josh. Like the talking stick, it doesn't actually do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like kindergarten. You can do it now, Josh. I'm not sure it works, Josh. Try to on here and see if that comes us here. Oh, on. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I'm Josh Wood. I get the distinct honor of getting the great instruments that uh, Darby and Jim just talked about to Venus and getting all that science data back to Earth. Uh, Lockheed Martin has had a long history working with NASA to uh, to go through and and um, supporting these deep space missions, dating all the way back to Viking, uh, the Viking one and two landers, as well as Magellan, which was the last uh, dedicated Venus mission to NASA. Um, we had a constant evolution of our spacecraft, and and what that's enabled is an architecture that supports. Uh, both orbiters, landers, flyline type missions, um, all in one succinct architecture that's able to support. And so you can see that uh, we've got uh, uh, aerobraking type missions like uh, what you see with Maven, which is what Veritas is based off of, as well as ones with sample return type pieces and aeroshells like Osiris Rex, um, as well as the, the Mars um, aeroshells that we. Uh, Worked with NASA on the past that support the mission. Um, so all these missions come together in order to, to support both Veritas and Da Vinci moving forward. We also have started up a small set architecture with Janus and Lunar Tropis later this year. And so that uh, that also enables um, some, some faster, cheaper type missions moving forward. So when we get to Veritas and Da Vinci, even though they look physically vastly different. One's an orbiter, one has an entry probe. The core architecture of them is common between the two. Uh, people don't have like the Colonel Quinn. The DNA of the two missions are actually very uh, similar when it comes to the spacecraft architecture to get those instruments to Venus. Uh, we're able to leverage core, uh, the core structure, the avionics, the whole power distribution system, GNC, propulsion, and thermal are all common between the two spacecraft. So that's really going to help us be able to uh, support leveraging those common designs to minimize cost and schedule risk. And so with that synergy, we're going to really be able to um, help really drive down that risk posture uh, for both missions. We're going to be that, that bridge between the Da Vinci and Veritas side 
in order to really make sure that we get the best Venus science possible out of these two missions. Uh, we're going to be able to leverage common procurements, uh, shared spares between the two missions, which is a great piece, but something we normally don't get to uh, leverage uh, between various missions. Uh, common test equipment, as well as that shared personnel. And so, obviously, our ultimate goal is that 100% mission success, and we really hope to do that by being able to share uh, this common architecture. And with that, so now on to the third one. So about three years ago, the Venus Exploration Advisory Group coined the term decade of Venus. At that time, we had no, no missions and lots of hope. And so we considered it absolutely a miracle when not only did uh, Da Vinci and Veritas get selected in one fell swoop by NASA, but then just a few months later, Envision was selected by ESA. So Boy, it's an embarrassment of riches. Um, and I've had the privilege of working closely with the Envision team because it turns out that the event spec instrument is a, a twin to the one on Veritas, the VEM on Veritas. So just as Josh was just talking about synergies in spacecraft, we also have synergies in instrumentation, um, such that I'm now working on calibrating two different spectrometers, uh, one on Veritas and one on Envision. So my Envision colleagues were kind enough to let me speak uh, to, to this mission, and it also is equipment rich, as Jim said. And I'm just going to speed through uh, some of the uh, amazing things that are on um, Envision. And, and the thing to remember is that this is going to be the third one in the sequence, and almost, well, every single one of these measurements is going to complement something that is done by either Veritas or Da Vinci. You, you almost couldn't have planned it better, but of course you couldn't have planned it. Um, so uh, Envision has a, has a Benstar, which is in fact being um, produced by the U.S., uh, it also has, and this is sort of a unique thing, it has a subsurface radar sounder. So it'll be able to do um, a few hundred meters below the surface at 20 meter vertical resolution, which is really important. A lot of the sur uh, surface features on Venus are covered up by the salt or buried in other ways. So it's going to be great to be able to see under the surface with this um, uh, radar sounder. Uh, then it has three spectrometers, you know, like what is a spectrometer, how much better could it get? So Benspec M is the one that is just like the one on Veritas. And this is significant because one of the things that we're really interested in on all these missions is change detection. And so the fact that Envision is going to come probably a, a decade after uh, Veritas means that when we look at the emissivity on the surface, we'll be able to look at changes. And this, this could tell us things like, is the surface actively uh, weathering, or it could also um, you know, allow us to, to look at different um, changes in different rock types as a result of interactions uh, in other, with the atmosphere. Uh, it also has um, a Venn spec H, which is going to complement the, the measurements being done by Da Vinci because it's going to look for sulfur and hydrogen uh, in the lower atmosphere. So again, a lovely uh, complementary measurement, high resolution atmospheric measurements. And then it also has um, an ultraviolet spectrometer again complementing Vinci, um, which will operate between 190 and 380 nanometers, so down there. And that will also look at the, it's mostly to look at the distribution of, of sulfur. So we're going to be looking for volcanic activity in a bunch of different ways with these uh, aggregate missions. Um, you know, we can look for spectroscopic signatures of sulfur. Uh, we can also look at the, the emissivity glow, because, you know, I'll make emissivity measurements at night, and a volcano has a special added glow, so we may see that. And then we can also see things like hydrogen that's uh, degassed by volcanoes. And we can see that in the, um, in the visible near infrared. So we have a bunch of different ways of looking at this um, question of volcanic activity. And then again, um, Ben Speck, you will, will complement the upper cloud and aerosol that to show me. Um, and Vision also has a radio science experiment, um, which will again now complement the gravity experiment that was done on Veritas, helping us to understand the. Um, the gravity field, the interior structure, the core size, and the state, um, and also allow us to uh, look at things um, in, uh, in the atmosphere. So here's a, a nice type of image of um, the Envision uh, folks. Uh, Envision is still in the planning stages, um, but uh, we're really excited to be helping, uh, helping the uh, ESA scientists by the U.S. is contributing the radar instrument, as I think I, heard, I noted. And uh, this is going to be the third in an amazing trio of spacecraft. So, 
Um, we thought we'd end up this this uh, presentation by just giving you this very wordy, intense thing, but it gives you everything there is to know about these three missions in one slide. Uh, so the left column is, is what we're looking at, uh, and the subsequent um, uh, columns will tell you what which mission does. So with that, I'll uh, open it to questions, and thank you very much for your attention. All right, where's the runners? There they are. There's runners. Run, come on. I got the mask. Can you put the mask on my hand? I can't. Okay, first question. Where's one? What do you hand? There. Everybody, up, up, four is up. Hi, I'm not sure who this. I'm not sure who this is for. Might be for several people, but uh, 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 first. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to pick it. I mean, I, I well, they they can figure out which. Maybe it's Jim Garden. I think he actually he's talking more about the atmosphere. Question is this: uh, If you look at Mars, we talk about Mars having like a very nil atmosphere now, and the idea is that because it doesn't have a magnetic field, but over the years, solar coronal mass ejections have eroded the atmosphere. Venus is a lot closer. Doesn't have that, doesn't have a magnetic field of, of any you know, strong magnitude. Why isn't the same thing happening there? Will we find out from your mission or one of these others and what the, what the differences between those two planets in that regard? Well, that's a great question. It really does tie all three missions together because, first, there has been no detected internal magnetic field of Venus, um, and there was a magnetometer on the Pioneer Venus missions of the late 70s. So that's a big issue. There is an induced one, we think, from the solar wind. But Venus is a slow rotator, very different. A day on Venus is longer than a year. So that's a very different beast than fast spinning Mars and fast spinning Earth. And that has a relationship to the interior, which Earth has to be looking at through its understanding of core and K2 and moment of inertia. Um, we will look at the, the factors, as you asked, about why Venus, through the evolution of noble gases, has retained such a large mass of atmosphere and some of the onset possibilities for how it ran away in the current greenhouse state and became, if you will, you know, the super dense atmosphere that we have. And so that partnership you're saying, that coupling comparing Venus and Mars is a key part of planetary sciences at NASA's program. We've flown Maven to look at that evolution on Mars. We've flown magnetometers on Mars Global Surveyor, Mario Pulis experiment. Um, but for Venus, we're going to look at the planet because of the way it is. Slow rotator, different state, much more massive atmosphere by actually three orders of magnitude than Mars is. So that's a key part of our solar system that makes us have these great opportunities to look for exo-Venuses. So one of the key follow-on questions may be after Veritas da Vinci envisioned, do we need to look at the state of crustal remnant magnetism in ways that you could potentially do with balloon-based missions in the lower clouds? Uh, because those kind of measurements are an art of the fourth kind of state. And so I suspect that's something that will be part of future landed or balloon-based missions. So great question. Um, and this is the beauty of our solar system. Next question. Somebody made a question. Uh, so you talked about uh, degassing of Venus. So would um, a combination of like Da Vinci and Veritas like help figure out why there's like how is degassing is happening on Venus? Why don't you go ahead? I can add what Da Vinci could do. Yeah, answer yes. <laughs> so how do you do that? Well, certainly uh, Veritas has um, very high resolution uh, ability to look for um, emissions of especially water, but also sulfur. And it's mostly water gas. You know, volcanism is often associated with several weight percent of water. So if we're flying over an area and we detect um, high water contents in the clouds on our cloud fans, then that's going to be a, a, a place that we want to zero in on. Uh, we also see, as I mentioned, the thermal emission. Many of you may have seen the images from Iceland this year, where in the darkness, you can see the glow being given off by the flows in Iceland. So there's a tremendous amount of, of boosted thermal emission that happens when volcanoes uh, erupt. 
Veritas will also see volcanism um, and degas, you know, the volcanism and degassing to a geologist are kind of the same thing. Um, so we'll also see it by uh, changes in topography. And then, of course, finally, the Da Vinci will see the changes in um, atmospheric gas over you, Jim. Thanks, Darby. And so exactly as, as Darby said, these are synergies that are built in. We will measure the isotopal loss of multiple species as high as 67 kilometers at parts per billion level. So if there are indicators from those species, um, and including the deuterium to hydrogen ratio of water, at the finest scale we can imagine measuring, same quality we've done on Mars now, multiple times for 10 years um, from the SAM uh, payload, um, we'll be able to see that. We'll also look at the isotopes of helium, which may be an indicator of volcanism in this state. We do that in volcanic rocks on Earth and in volcanic emissions. So we will also, as we transcend the atmosphere, measure trace gases, which can be harbingers of states of outgassing, degassing, and all those things work together. Perhaps most important from the Da Vinci standpoint is the noble gases, though, because they are non-reactive. So whatever you get from their isotopic ratios is what's been happening. They cannot be contaminated much by other processes. So we think this synergy between Veritas and Da Vinci, and of course, continuing to envision, will give us a very good picture of that. And that will let the modelers really go crazy with what's the history of this beautiful atmosphere, um, rocky planet at Venus. My question is about Venus and spin. Would these missions help figure out why it's been so slow, or like has it always been like this, or did something happen? Well, I can just say two things. We will not have all the answers. That's a very uh, powerful question. It goes back to thoughts that Tommy Aarons published in 1980s, or even Tom, who talked about, you know, why why does a big rocky planet de spin or was it born that way? It's so hard to imagine dynamically it was born that way. So people have posited ideas about mega impacts of the sort that would have formed the moon in the Earth-Moon system um, to do that to Venus. But even those have, um, what should I say, uh, issues with the, with the energetics. So this is the key question. Um, why do we have slow rotators? Um, we think other exoplanets may be like that too, from some of the emerging thinking about exoplanets. So this is a key question. I think the geophysics, and I'll turn to Darby, that, that Veritas does with couple to, um, to envision will be key to that. Yes, yeah, certainly. Well, certainly, as I mentioned, uh, knowing, the, knowing the state of the core is absolutely key, and the size of it is absolutely key to understand rotation. So, yeah, I mean, Jim's right. I, I, I wanted to actually say that, you know, it's important to realize that these three missions will catch us up to where Mars was like 15, 20 years ago. So, you know, we like to think of this as a, the start of a Venus program. Um, we're going to certainly ask more questions than we can answer. And um, so keep asking those questions. They're all good ones in there. There's many more, uh, many more to come that will come out of the results of these missions. But we need a Venus program. All right, Jim has a question online. Yeah, hi, uh, good morning. Um, so uh, we have an online question that goes right to that point, kind of. Um, for future Venus missions, uh, sorry, could a very large launch vehicle open up uh, scientific areas that are currently unattainable you know, because of size and mass issues? Go ahead, Josh. That's a question for Josh. I think we've got it. Yeah, certainly. Certainly, the launch vehicle is one of the big constraints. Where the, the bigger the science field is, that you want to be able to take the, the larger launch vehicle that you need. And Venus, in particular, is actually harder to get to than Mars. Just to get into the inner solar system and being able to slow down ends up being a, a, one of the, the bigger challenges. Um, a larger launch vehicle does support getting us off the ground and in the right trajectory. It doesn't have to slow down, uh, but but in order to get that that extra drag. Arrow breaking or, or some function like that, uh, we do need the larger launch vehicle to support those, those pieces. And Ron, you can volunteer to speak. Yes. Uh, so just to follow up what Josh uh, mentioned, as, as we at the beginning, we, we show as well that human exploration has a very key component on this because they will be using large launch vehicles. And they will provide an opportunity to do Venus gravity assist to shorten their 
cruise period to Mars. And in that, in that context, be able to do a lot more science for Venus as well as they do, uh, you know, the Venus gravity. So there are good opportunities in the future for more Venus exploration. And to that extent, if I may, I just wanted to mention that there is an initiative that uh, NASA and ESA are kicking off to engage more of the Venus science community internationally at large, globally, and it's called the Venus Science Coordinating Group that soon the agencies will be making a call to really gather more of these ideas on how to really, um, you know, capitalize and enlarge and ma maximize the science returns of all these different com components of Venus exploration. Thank you. Okay, we got a question over here, I believe. My lady, yes, she is. She was, she was first. She's pretty big. What? <laughs> what? what? I didn't hear. Anyway, um, for Jim, um, so what, um, what, what will happen to the descent yeah. at the end? So Aki asks the existential question. Um, so uh, our descent sphere, a meter in diameter, titanium with special seals will traverse the atmosphere and come to rest at the surface, impacting um, and touching down at somewhere around 11 or 12 meters per second. That's about the speed your boat, if you have one, I don't, um, might hit a dock at about 20 knots. So if you hit a dock at 20 knots, the naval folks here, you know, not all bad, but not all good. So we expect to touch down and if all goes well, and the, the unknown characteristic of the mountains of Venus, the Tesla that you heard Darby talking about and I, unknown at meter scales, they cooperate. Our spacecraft could in principle survive for around 12 minutes of radio communication time. So we could maintain a link to our Lockheed Martin-based uh, carrier relay imaging spacecraft flying overhead. That would allow in-situ measurements at the surface with our mass spectrometer perhaps, and playing back many more of the images we will have collected on terminal descent the other thing is um, our spacecraft thermally should be stable for around 18 minutes. After that point, we're above 60, 65C, and the, the radio transmitter system, it's an S-band system, could go unstable. And we don't have any requirement to survive that, those conditions. So the spacecraft, uh, contrary to, to some people, have been thinking, will not implode and look like some little punctured um, you know, orange. Um, we expect it to be an intact system, and it may be seeable by the radars as a kind of reflector from the Veritas and Envision systems. And that's up to the sensitivity of their systems and they're working at. So great question, Aki. We will leave our debris on Venus as the Venus and so space spacecraft. Um, and uh, you know, we our little NASA logos will be on there. So uh, they'll come and find us. And I think some some future astronauts will go get it. So thanks for your question. Okay, last question. My microphone right here. Yeah, this we hate picking on Jim all the time, but this is relevant to you. Um, what is your current, to you personally, most credible or most supported theory about the origins of the atmosphere on Venus? What do you? Well, that, uh, thanks, Jan. That's a big question. I mean, well, as I said, this currently, what's the thought? Well, there's a there's a rich, um, which I say, there's a rich understanding today from what we've measured of the history of this big atmosphere. It may have been an evolved atmosphere that, that was created in a different chemistry than it is today, perhaps perhaps more Earth-like, being closer to the sun, that then evolved by the input of volatiles, the cometary asteroidal impacts, and volcanic activity, outgassing volatiles, that allowed it to evolve. The current state is, of course, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, and trace gases, um, but mostly CO2, like Mars is. So the evolutionary pathways of, of of that atmosphere require us actually to understand the noble gases, which have not been completely measured. So if you look at the curves for those key things, those, those if you will, fingerprints of what went on, we know a few of them pretty well from Pioneer Venus, tribute to that great Pioneer Venus large probe of 1978, but others are incomplete. So the lever arm goes crazy. We can't tell whether it was stripped by, in, by mega impacts, which could get to the question of, of the strange um, slow rotating state of the planet, if big enough, pretty hard to imagine, but whatever. So there's a lot of big gas, Jan, and that's why a really good chemistry probe will, we think, resolve at least the boundary conditions to test the ideas. 
This type of smear may have been partially blown off by big impacts, which has been hypothesized for Mars, as you know, and happens even on Earth with the big impacts of Chicxulub, which blew off half the atmosphere, we believe. And so we don't know how that works on Venus. And so we think the atmosphere slowly grew, was being stripped by solar wind, but not enough to, to impede its growth. And so the measurements we make will try to fill in those gaps. And there are indicator trace gases that we think we'll be able to measure with the Venus mass spectrometer. And they tell us as diagnostic little clues to what may have gone on, at least in the last billion years of Venus history. So there's a lot of unknowns. Sorry, I'm not giving you a definitive thing. There's a couple of great Venus books out there from the University of Arizona Press and some great new papers from the Akatsuki team and from the Venus Express team. Lab work going on, a new Venus climate model. So lots of stuff, but there's some big gaps in understanding. And that's why we have a mission like the Vinci Week. Well, and very tough, of course. Um, and, and efficient. A lot to do. As Darby said, you know, we're, we're crawling out of kindergarten at Venus, and, you know, we're, we're past middle school on Mars. So we want to catch up because we think both planets have a great lesson for all of us. But good question. Excellent. Uh, well, uh, I'd just like to personally thank this panel. Uh, what a great way to start off the day. Thank you so much to all of you. Thank you.